Hi everyone, Carl Steele here, English 4113, class 15, on the question of universal human rights and the 1805 Haitian Constitution, in particular, Article 14, which declares that henceforth all Haitians shall be known under the generic denomination or definition as Blacks. So some words first on universal claims of human rights, the most famous document of this sort is the 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizens from uh, produced by French revolutionaries. And you might want to pause this video and just read through this, although you have it in your reading class. And I want you to pay attention in particular to the way that this document creates uh, the collective. What is it that it is talking to and who owns the rights that it's talking about? Uh, the general purpose of this is to ensure that the law does not serve any single individual, for example, a king or a president who's out of control, but rather that it proceeds from the people and is decided for the people and it serves to protect them. But who are the people and how does it talk about the people? It uses phrases like a nation or like society or the general will or punishments that are only that are strictly and obviously necessary. Well, for whom, for what, what makes it necessary? What is the public order? Who is the public when we have the public order? So you'll see that in every case, in all those key words, I provided it in French as well. So this document, of course, is originally written in French. And if you have another language, um, it's very good at the very bare minimum for checking translations and to ensure that translations are good in this case, they are. So um, the questions again, and you're going to do this in your Google form, are things like, what's the nation? What do you think? What's at stake in that? What is society? What do you think that is? Is that different from the nation? What is the public order? Uh, what is public in that case? And what is the general will, which is another thing it refers to? So we can think about all those things and the problems of who counts and who doesn't count in the creation of this thing called public order or the general will, whose ideas and opinions are going to be left out of that. So the classic instance, of course, in the 18th century would be the place of enslaved people. And here I offer an image, very famous image from an anti-slavery pamphlet. Um, and which is reproduced in a variety of media over the late 18th and, uh, and early 19th centuries. This one was sold at 144 Nassau Street in New York, which is an address that's currently near City Hall. And as you can see here is an image of a chained black man uh, on his knees looking up to someone asking the question, am I not a man and a brother? And the answer is, of course, yes, you are. And therefore, you deserve to be treated better than this. And we'll come back around to this image and this question in just a bit. But there's another group, perhaps, that's being left out of this Declaration of the Rights of Man, droit de l'homme, right, of man, uh, and of citizen, citoyen. Uh, that's the masculine form of the word. Yes, who is man? Well. Here's an answer that's provided by a, uh, the only woman during the French Revolution who is executed for her political views. She's a playwright and pamphleteer, a woman named Olympe de Gorges, uh, 1748 to 1793, that's the year she was beheaded. And she wrote a very strange and interesting document called the Declaration of the Rights of Women Woman and Citizen, 1791. And what she's done is she's taken uh, point by point the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and she's added in feminine versions of the words. The law should be the expression of the general will. All citizenesses and citizens should take part in person or by the representatives in its formation. So this works a little better in French than it does in English. Uh, English doesn't have grammatical gender anymore and really hasn't since the 13th century. Uh, generally speaking, if you want to make something grammatically feminine in English, you have to add like an S to it, waiter, waiter versus waitress, actor versus actress. And of course, in French and Spanish, uh, you, and German and many other languages, you have grammatical gender inbuilt notions that certain words are feminine, certain words are masculine. And sometimes this doesn't really track up with uh, what we think of as real gender, right? The moon in Spanish and French is a girl, and in German, the moon is a boy. Why is that? Well, and there are 
reasons, but I don't need to go into them right now. Um, so what you can do with grammatical gender um, is you can actually, uh, by bringing in the feminine form of a word, for example, you can actually help underline the way that the normative way of speaking erases women or doesn't acknowledge them. So this is what Olympe de Gorge does when she writes, all citizens, citizens, Citizenesses, citizenesses. It's very hard to say, isn't it? And citizens in French, it's actually easier. Citoyen, a citoyen, uh, should take part in person or by the representatives in its formation. So it needs to be for everyone, um, men and women both. Or she says, no one should be disturbed for his fundamental opinions. Women have the right to mount the scaffold that is to be executed, indeed, as she was, and so she should have a right equally to mount the rostrum, and in French it's à la tribune, the raised platform for making public speech. So they should be able to be political actors if they're going to be punishable. Therefore, they need to also be part of the political consciousness, provided that those manifestations do not trouble public order as established by law. So she is providing um, basically making space for women as part of this. Incidentally, she was executed not for these opinions, but because she uh, wasn't entirely in favor of the king and queen of France being executed. So that's that was the problem that the male revolutionaries had with her primarily. So she's also interesting for this. Um, she was an anti-slavery uh, writer. And so here is her work, uh, which I can translate very loosely as reflections on black men. Um, are black humans, right? Um, and so she, here she writes, I have only one piece of advice to give to the actors of the Comédie Française, and it is the only favor I will ask of them in my life, that is to wear the Negro color and clothing. And so here I've modified a translation by Sylvie Molta. Uh, she had written a play uh, about black people and it never got performed by the major theater of Paris. And she's very grumpy about that. And she's saying it really should be staged. And of course, in order to stage this play about Black people in Paris in the late 18th century, you're going to have to take white actors and make them Black somehow. Presumably, there aren't Black actors in Paris. Maybe there are in the late 18th century who can play these roles. If there are, please disregard what I'm about to say. But it's an interesting case here where Blackface actually allows for certain kinds of representation that are positive in terms of the struggle against white supremacy um, that the, the absolute refusal of blackface would prevent. That is, um, if, you, if you need to have blackface to represent black people on stage, well then in an anti-slavery case, actually blackface can be useful. Uh, and that's a very interesting thing to think about in terms of the history of this particular theatrical problem. Um, so that's just something I'm throwing out there uh, because it helps complicate our understanding of the normal history of this. Um, okay, so coming back around to that question of, am I not a man and a brother? So between 1791 and 1804, there is a revolution in Haiti and it is successful. It's a revolution of enslaved people and also of free black people against the white slave owners who are French. Uh, and it is the most successful revolt of enslaved people in the Western hemisphere ever. Uh, and it results in the first black republic in the Americas. Um, so they are ultimately successful. And so we can take that question Am I not a man and a brother? And think about it through, as I'm about to, three images uh, that are concerned with Haiti and its revolution. So here's an image uh, from the late 18th century, uh, flogging of a slave by another slave. That's what it's called. A um, detail of a map of the housing facilities at Fevre de Saint-Manuel with the vign vign vignettes of daily life on plantation Haiti at the time called saint Domingue. Um, so I got this from Art Store as a database that I think you should get comfortable with because it's much better than Google Images, of course, in providing images that are well sourced. You can actually understand what they are, what their dates are, where they're housed, etc. You're going to get information that's going to help you as a scholar and a researcher and not just somebody who's 
fooling around online. So uh, here we can pose the question, am I not a man and a brother? And we see something like this. Uh, well, certainly this person we want to say yes to. What do we say to this person who's beating this other person? Is he not also a man and a brother? Yes and no. Um, who's, who, is, who is this uh, enslaved person posing that question to, if it's being asked in this case, to the white slavers, to the, uh, the black man who's being compelled to, or encouraged to, or willing to beat this other person who's also enslaved? Um, how does that question work in this context? Or we can pose the question, how does, uh, how does this question work in this particular context? Here's a portrait from 1877 by a Haitian artist named uh, Louis Rigaud. Uh, it's a portrait of the uh, revolutionary uh, Toussaint Louverture. Uh, uh, Toussaint Louverture um, was born in 1743 in, in Haiti, um, despite what I just wrote here, uh, and he died in a, in a fort in, uh, in France uh, when he was captured by the French. He was leading the revolution and in Haiti, and he was captured and taken to France, and there he died in, in total misery in a fortress, but it was too late for the French. They were going to lose that particular war. Uh, Toussaint was a name he was born with, and uh, Louis Chiro is a name that he gave himself. It means the one who opens the way. So it's a revolutionary name, and here's a portrait of him. How do we answer this question? Am I not a man and a brother when we have a, a man who is a military leader? Uh, who is standing here upright and very dignified and about you know leading a revolution that is killing white people to drive them out of a country. How does that question work in this context? Uh, and finally, we have something like this. Am I not a man and a brother? Here are in, uh, formerly enslaved Haitians, perhaps, uh, certainly black Haitians who are executing French, white French soldiers. Revenge taken by the Black Army for the cruelties practiced on them by the French, which is from a book from 1805, an historical account of the Black Empire of Haiti, written by a, a Britishman named Marcus Rainsford, who had visited Haiti because he was interested in recruiting Black soldiers to help fight against the French because the English were at war with the French again, as they often are in their history. And so he saw Haiti as an opportunity to help help that long struggle. And while he was not an abolitionist, he thought that the British should respect the integrity of the new Haitian Republic. How does this question get changed when we're looking at an instance of justifiable revenge and the legal execution of white people by black people? And how does that differ from the image of the black supplicant, right? I think in every instance, we have to answer that question, yes. But the way that yes works and what it does to our understanding of the larger body politic changes depending on what it is the Black person is doing in that image. Are they simply begging for our mercy? Are they leading a revolution? Are they executing white people, right? Um, so I have those questions in mind to talk about on Tuesday. So just some very quick background on race and politics in pre-revolutionary Haiti. It's a very complicated racial setup and it can be divided between, I believe, five groups. There's the white planters who are very conservative and French, the Grand Blanc. Uh, there, are the, there are the somewhat more revolutionary uh, uh, small whites, the ones, the Petit Blanc, who are not as wealthy. Um, there are the mixed race free people because uh, unlike the English system, the uh, French system of enslavement is, has more inbuilt opportunities for uh, enslaved Black people to be uh, rendered free uh, legally. So these are called the uh, men of color, uh, the hommes de couleur. Um, and then we have free Black people who are not mixed race. Um, then we have the uh, black people who had fled and are maybe living in the mountains someplace, uh, sometimes permanently in a, in a grand marronage, and sometimes temporarily in a petit marronage. Um, and then we have simply enslaved people, right? So this is a very complicated six-part arrangement of, of class and skin color and status, right? It's a very complicated racial hierarchy. And in the second constitution of Haiti, this is all wiped away. And so I've provided this in a variety of different translations. So the French original is down here. Then uh, English translations 
uh, there's an English translation provided, uh, also published that same year, 1805. There's also a Spanish one, which is on the very first slide of this presentation. Um, and so every major language that's, that's used in the Americas, I mean, except for probably Portuguese, uh, has a version of this constitution because Haiti wanted this to be known. And here is the key thing, all exception, right? And that's a fine translation of color among the children of one, among the children of one of the same family of whom the chief magistrate is the father being necessarily deceased, the Haitians shall henceforward be known only by the generic appellation of blacks. So the, the translation is a little bit peculiar, but the main thing is this bit to say that henceforth all Haitians shall be known as black. Um, that is a radical transformation. It, it recognizes that race is primarily a legal category. In this case, the legal category is going to say that every Haitian citizen is black. So that wipes away the entire racial hierarchy. Um, that's, that's the aim of it. Now, you probably, I hope, read this blog post at Penn, posted at Penn, the Penn's website, uh, called Race in the Haitian Constitution of 1805. And I have some issues with it, which I'm just going to talk about. And we have got this slide and one more. So uh, the writer is, is quoting various scholars on this issue. And so uh, it's uh, on writing about this particular clause of the 1805 constitution. So here's one that says uh, Germans, and so this, this says that this, um, this document highlights the radical reconceptualization, reconceptualization of race that underpinned Haiti's entry in the world stage. Now, the thing that I really want to stress is that race had been radically reconceptualized already in the Americas in the 17th century, simply in the creation of legal categories of whiteness and blackness, the creation of white people and the creation of black people as legal categories, which is the kind of categories they exist as, is something that's equally revolutionary. Right? And so bear that in mind when you read something like this. Anne Gulick argues that the quote 1805 constitution contains what in today's lexicon would be called a set of radical post-colonial aspirations, a community imagined through a legal narrative is capable of doing something none of its models had done before, identifying both blackness and humanity as basic signifiers of citizenship. Now, um, we can reverse this and say, of course, models had done this before simply in a reverse way, which is identifying whiteness and humanity as the basic signifiers of citizenship, right? So what this document is doing is simply reversing the uh, racial regime and the creation of racial categories that had happened in the Caribbean in the 17th century and in North America in the 17th century. It's simply saying uh, everyone, every, every person who is a citizen is necessarily black. And every person who belongs to Haiti as a citizen is going to be black. We've already have these kinds of regimes in place. It's just typically that everyone who's a citizen is white. Um, so here we go. Disrupting any biologistic or racialist expectations, Sybil Fisher argues in modernity disavowed, they make a black a mere implication of being Haitian, and thus a political rather than biological category. I would say it's always a political category. Whiteness and blackness are always political. They just imagine that they are biological categories, right? That biological categorization is an attempt to naturalize racial divisions that exist primarily and almost exclusively as cultural categories and as legal categories. And so again, I take some issue with the way this is framed because it doesn't recognize the way that whiteness is just as false a category as blackness. And what this constitution does is simply um, push at that fictionality of race and say, look, let's just put this on the table. We can make anybody white or anybody black that we want to through the law. So um, bear this in mind as well in my last slide, uh, thinking about a book that I've mentioned before in some of these talks, uh, which I read earlier this year, uh, Frank B. Wilderson III's Afro-Pessimism. So um, what does it mean um, to be Afro-pessimist? One of the things that Wilderson is doing is arguing that Blackness is a fundamental category of modernity and it is it overcodes and overdetermines everything. So the story he tells is of being a, a man in his 20s working at a museum as a security guard in Minnesota. And, uh, and his coworker is a Palestinian uh, who is, uh, who's interested in the Palestinian struggle against Israel. Uh, and Wilderson is very eager to ally with this man. He sees that they are engaged in a similar struggle, Wilderson against white supremacy and this Palestinian man against the Israeli occupation. Um, but then at some point, the Palestinian says, 
I was captured by Israeli soldiers and they were Ethiopian and that was super humiliating. That is, I was being searched by blacks and I found that awful. And Wilderson at that point realizes that, um, well, I'll read what he writes. There I sat yearning in solidarity with my Palestinian friends yearning for the full restoration of Palestinian sovereignty, mourning in solidarity with my friends mourning over the loss of his insurgent cousin, yearning that is for the historical and political redemption of what I thought was a violated commons to which we belonged, when all of a sudden my friend reached down into the unconscious of his people and slapped me upside the head with a wet Jim's shoe. The startling realization that not only was I barred ab initio from the beginning, from the denouement of historical and political redemption, but that the borders of redemption are policed by whites and non-whites alike, even as they kill each other. So I would say we need to understand the 1805 Haitian Constitution, Article 14, within the context of Afro-pessimism and in the context of Blackness is a category of fundamental exclusion, of political exclusion, exclusion from full humanity of the modern era, and that rather than simply declaring race non-existent in the Haitian, um, in the new Haiti, or rather than declaring everyone white, it's saying, no, everyone here is black, everyone belongs on the outside. And what happens to the political reality when the outside asserts itself as the normative and how does that transform our understanding of what counts as the people and what counts as society? So complicated questions, but I'm hoping we can talk about this on Tuesday.